All right, that news wrap ushers us into the second session of our bulletin today, where we focus on the threshold of withdrawing graft cases in the country. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, this particular matter is of public interest, bearing in mind the fight against graft and how it is of public importance. Now, we want to have a conversation based on this. What exactly does it mean to the criminal justice system when the ODPP and the ESCC are at loggerheads in terms of withdrawal of cases? Does it point to a bigger problem ahead in the prosecution of graft cases in the country? And perhaps just to put context to this particular conversation, allow me to bring up a uh, ruling passed by Justice Professor Sifuna in a case before the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Division Court on Josfat Kipkoech Sirma versus the Director of Public Prosecution, where Justice Professor Sifuna delivered a ruling, part of which said, and I quote, this to me is a laundry manner of prosecution practice that is steadily, undesirably, and notoriously taking root in Kenya. In criminal trials, the prosecution should present the evidence it has and let the court decide. He goes further to say, the prosecution cannot, in the course of the trial, suddenly make a 360 degree turn and declare the accused innocent. Such a declaration is unacceptable and extrajudicial. Well, that's an interesting ruling that was passed in 31st January this year, and perhaps putting to question the move we've seen by the ODPP to withdraw some graft cases, some of them high profile in the country. What exactly does it mean to help us understand more on the threshold of withdrawing of these graft cases? I'm joined by two guests. Allow me to introduce them right now. Sheila Masinde, the Executive Director of Transparency International, is joining me in studio. Thank you so much for your time, Sheila. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Equally joined by Dr. Maxwell Miyawa, who's a scholar and constitutional lawyer. Wakili Asante Sana for your time. Karibu to our studios. Thank you so much, Jason. Okay, so before we get to the reaction of what you have to say about that particular ruling, I'd like to begin with you, Sheila, because Transparency International is quite vocal about Marta's anti-graft fighting corruption in the country. And recently, in your 2023 Corruption Perception Index, you revealed how weakening justice systems leaves corruption unabated. So talk to us about this, how transparency, public trust, in the criminal justice process is quite important. Thanks, thanks, Jesse, and thank you for having this conversation at this point in time, yeah. when not just us, but various Kenyans are having concerns about the withdrawal of uh, corruption cases, and also acquittals of uh, people who have been accused of corruption. There have been some cases which have been in that pipeline for quite some time, but then we've recently lost a number of them. And so it's quite disheartening, particularly when you look at uh, where the fight against corruption needs to be going. And despite some of the uh, commitments even coming from political leaders that have been made um, in regard to strengthening, enhancing the fight against corruption. So for the Corruption Perceptions Index for 2023, and this is a global index by the Transparency International Global Movement that was released about three weeks ago now, okay. on January 30th, uh, for, the, for the last year, for 2023. It, it makes a nexus between justice, access to justice, mm -hmm. and corruption. What, is a, what, is a, what it has found is that countries which you find at the bottom of the uh, CPI uh, are also the same countries that you'll find at the bottom of the rule of law index and where they are pretty much what we'd call dysfunctional justice systems. What does that mean? If you have a dysfunctional justice system, it means that basically uh, you're, you're not able to get remedies you know, from, from that justice system. And there have been questions whether we are heading that direction mm -hmm. as a country, because if we're not able to get justice, for corruption cases. We've had a number of cases that have been withdrawn. Uh, last year, we tried, attempted to even quantify, and even that quantification, I would say, was just a drop in the ocean. When you looked at the cases that had been dropped, withdrawn by the ODPP in yes. one and a half years since September, 
2022, we found that that is almost costing Kenya 73 billion. At that time, uh, we've not even <laughs> added the Aurora and Kimwarari case and others that have joined that pile. Yeah. We've not even looked at cases where there have been acquittals. And suspiciously, there have been no, at least we are not aware of, publicly, there are no publicly known attempts by the ODPP to pick some of these cases that have, you know, they, when they w w with have been withdrawn or where they've been acquitted. Yeah. Because <laughs> naturally, if you've worked so hard, worked so hard in quotes. Yeah, to build up a case. <laughs> to build uh, up a case. Yeah. Some of those cases have taken so long. Uh, if they've taken almost five years mm -hmm. in court, mm -hmm. in, the, in the hearing and uh, hearing process, in the adjudication process, but they take and uh, there's, there's time a period before where they have to be investigated, then the cases filed, the case files have to be reviewed or analyzed. That, that takes an, a, a long period of time, not in a period of time if you ask me. True. It's something again that we have to look in terms of access to justice. Why are these cases taking so long? But they have taken long, they, you, you have consumed taxpayers' money in investigations. And, and you know corruption cases are not, you know, they're, they're not straight jackets. Mm -hmm. uh, affairs, you know, you, you really have to invest. Sometimes you ha get forensic auditors, forensic investigators. Sometimes you even have to get, you know, expertise from outside yeah, yeah. To, to come and look into those matters. So it costs a lot mm -hmm. of money. Then you have to review the file. There's that back and forth normally between the, can, between the ODPP and the investigator. Then they go to court. You know, you're talking about judges' time, magistrates' time, uh, lawyers, uh, prosecutors, all these people have taken their time. So there's a lot of technical human resources that goes in that you have to quantify. So we've only quantified, you know, the, the value of, uh, of that case at, at the point when it was the charges were made. Yeah. What was the value of that case? What was, what was the amount of money that was said to have been mm -hmm. lost? Mm -hmm. So if we were to go deeper, which we, <laughs> which we need be much more capacity, yeah, yeah. the amount of money could be more. Okay. And that's why we are so concerned because it means that when the justice system doesn't work for you, mm -hmm. it means that you're not able to safeguard public resources, that we are losing public resources at a time when the country needs them the most. And that's one of the things that we have highlighted in the Corruption Perceptions Index, okay. that when countries have dysfunctional justice systems, then it means that that comes at a great cost to the public because they are not guaranteed of their rights. Okay. Wakili Miao, as you come in, the presumption of innocence until proven guilty stands. And as we speak about this graft cases, it's proper to note that the DPP is mandated by law to make the decision to charge. So let's talk about the prosecutor. How do they make that decision to charge? What's the legal requirement to start graft proceedings of an accused person? What's the evidence threshold, as by your understanding? Yeah, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, yes, indeed, is the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecution, who is the repository of the mandate of public prosecution. It's a constitutional mandate. And the Constitution stops there. The Constitution does not provide framework. It does not provide guidelines. So those guidelines, the DPP, the former DPP, came up with what he called the decision to charge in 2019. And it provides for a process. So talking about the legal underpinning of how a decision to charge is made, it is provided in law. It should not be a whimsical decision or at least a politically expedient decision. Mm -hmm. Now, in the decision to charge, the first thing that a prosecutor looks at is what they call the key evidence. The key evidence, the, bas the basis upon which you can identify the person who has committed the crime, and you can also identify the elements of the crime. That is to say that once the police uh, conclude their investigations and they come up with a police file, mm -hmm. that file is handed over to the DPP. Okay. At that point, there is a presumption, or at least there should be a presumption, that there is what we call the key evidence. So the key evidence is there that leads you to the person who committed the crime and the crime that person has committed at the very beginning. Now, then the second stage that the public prosecutor uh, makes is uh, whether uh, uh, that evidence is sufficient enough, you know, whether it can sustain a, a, a conviction, even by just merely looking at it. Mm -hmm. Then the second question the prosecutor asks himself is, is it in the public interest? The reason why they have to ask the public interest consideration is that 
normally prosecution is not the only way of uh, uh, realizing criminal accountability. There could probably be others. Mm -hmm. You know, there is asset uh, seizure these days yeah, yeah. of forfeiture, there's reconciliation, mediation. There's even a civil process in which if once it is established that somebody has illegally acquired public assets, you can even file a civil case. Mm -hmm. So the traditional notion of prosecution is not the only one. Now, that is how a prosecutor ends up with the decision to charge. There is key evidence that leads or points to the person who has committed the offense and the offense itself and the person who has committed the offense. That is the reason why we say that later on, when there is a complete volte face and a, a decision is made to withdraw the charges, the question then should be, where is the key evidence, the basis upon which the prosecution was instituted. Has it finally disappeared? Does it find, has it finally, uh, doesn't point to the person who committed the offense? Does it not, person, it doesn't uh, point to the, the offense that person has committed? So those are some of the questions that I think the court needed to interrogate. That is, however, not to say that we have completely, uh, the person who makes an application to withdraw a charge, really um, the, 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 the benefit, the constitutional right of the presumption of innocence doesn't apply. No, mm -hmm. it still does apply. And by the way, the prosecution is merely a process of establishing the truth or not, or the guilt or the not guiltiness of a person. Okay. It is not a condemnation. Mm -hmm. Really, it's not a condemnation. So it's a decision that only the court can make. So, Wakili Miawa, still with you, because my limited legal knowledge uh, leads me to understand that if the glove does not fit, you must acquit. We all know of that famous case. But what exactly is the standard legal process when it comes to withdrawal of a graft case from the courts? What's the threshold that perhaps hasn't been met in mm -hmm. some of these high-profile graft cases that raises eyebrows, especially when it's the prosecution that says, hey, hold up, I don't think I have enough evidence, yeah? Two things that I think in my analysis I have made. One is the way first in which the DPP understands their mandate or understands their role. In my view, I think the DPP is still minimalist in the understanding of the mandate that the Constitution has conferred upon him. And that is the reason why he thinks that whenever there's a criminal offense or there's a conduct that is alleged to constitute criminal offense, prosecution is the only way. Mm -hmm. The second thing, um, which I think is clogging, uh, which I think is responsible for the withdrawal of these cases, is the rationale or the basis upon which these decisions are made. They are politically convenient and expedient prosecutorial processes. Now, whenever political biases mm -hmm. are embedded in the prosecution process, you realize that you are actually offending Article 157, 11 of the Constitution that talks about one, public interest, two, the interest of justice, and the disinclination to abuse the criminal justice processes. Mm -hmm. That is the reason why you realize that Sometime three, four months or two, three years later, there is what we call the complete volte face to withdraw these charges because of the political biases that these office holders take or perceive these cases. And I can give you several examples. One of them, and I think the, 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 this, uh, the former DPP, who is now the director of uh, uh, NIS, uh, NIS yeah. actually he made a political confession a few months before he left the office. And he said that he was receiving pressure from the DCI. Remember, and of course the DCI was receiving that pressure from the office, from some higher office. And remember, yeah. under the Constitution, uh -huh. the DPP cannot be directed by anybody else. It is him who has the mandate to, in, to direct the Inspector General of Police. Remember, the, the Minister for Interior cannot direct the Inspector General or the DCI to make any criminal investigations mm -hmm. or any criminal allegations. Only the DPP can. How did it become that the DPP was acting under the instructions of a junior officer? That was a clear, clear constitutional violation. Okay, okay. So, the, so that is the reason why we end up with withdrawals. In terms of the law of withdrawal, of course the DPP has the power to withdraw cases True. at any stage before judgment. 
That withdrawal has constitutional safeguards. You know, it's not a blank check. It must conform to one of two things. One of the things I think Justice Sifuna has explained that look, when it comes to the issue of the sufficiency of the evidence, mm -hmm. and when you talk about evidence, you talk about relevance, admissibility, and reliability, the DPP or any officer under him in charge of that case cannot make that decision. That decision can only be made by the court. So on the question of the evidence, of course, which will lead to in, uh, absolving the person or incriminating him, it is now far removed from his mandate. It is only the court that, and I think Justice Sefona is right in that regard. The other thing, which I refer to as a minimalist understanding of the mandate of the DPP is that, by the way, there has not been a complete mental shift in, the, in that office to the context of the 2010 constitution that requires one, accountability for everything that you do. Mm -hmm. People are still tethered to the old archaic culture of how prosecutions were conducted in this country, where the attorney general those days would rise up one day and of course he would direct the DPP who was then under his office to just go and stand before the court and withdraw the case. Yeah. That cannot be constitutionally viable in the post-2010 constitutional dispensation. Okay. There okay. must be accountability and explanation. So, Sheila, talk to us mm. about the same issue in terms of threshold of withdrawal of cases, because we've had instances, the former uh, DPP mentioning that he was misguided by the DCI in terms of the strength, in terms of the concrete evidence in some of these cases. How do we best ensure perhaps enhance collaboration be the, between these two very important offices. Yeah. One, just to agree with uh, Wakili, yes. that you, you read political mischief in some of these withdrawals. Simple evidence. You withdraw a case today, and the next day someone is appointed in public office. In the, in the last case of the, for the Aurora Kimura mm -hmm. case, we have the former CS within 56 days appointed as an advisor in the office of the president. And, and there are many other examples, and we have done that analysis of where are these people who were beneficiaries of case withdrawals. So I agree in regard to you, there's, there's some political mischief that you, you, would, you will read there, or mm. can I say political influence as well, uh, in terms of where these directions are, are, are coming from. The, the other second point, as I said earlier, that up to this day, if we have not seen any attempts to, to re-review those cases, because some were withdrawn and they said that we're going to review these matters. Um, we, we, we thought that we had very strong cases which met the evidentiary threshold at the time when they were first, uh, you know, when the charges were first made as per the decision to charge guidelines. But then you find, in, in the, for example, in, in this last case of Sirma, um, 23 witnesses later, you realize, oops, this case is so weak. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the, the, the Aror case, you had 49 witnesses, eight, only eight are interrogated, 41 are not. Yeah. You bring a witness, you have taken the labor of bringing a witness, and then you say, yeah. uh, no question, mm -hmm. you are the prosecutor. In fact, I was just telling Wakili earlier that soon they're going to be rendered jobless as the defense <laughs> lawyers <laughs> because the prosecutors are doing a, a, a a harder job in terms of defending. Yeah. Yet the people that they should be defending are Kenyans. Mm -hmm. They should be defending taxpayers' resources. Mm -hmm. You know, they should be defending the constitution. Let as and, and as and I agree. You know, you're, you're innocent until pro proven guilty. But as a prosecutor, your job is to defend. The, you're there on behalf of the public. Yeah. You know that uh, that office that you hold is a public trust given to you by the people of Kenya. If you look at Article 73 of, of the Constitution on what public office means, it's a public trust given to you. You know, <laughs> it's delegated to you by the people of Kenya. So you have to serve the interests first of the Kenyan public. When you look at Article 157, as he says, you know, you are subservient <coughs> to the public interest, uh, the interest of administration of justice, and, and, and not other, 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 other influences. So in regard to your, your question, what I would say is that the, we now have decision to charge guidelines. So at the point where you felt this, the case was so strong, sometimes you ask yourself, 
what happened in between. You know, some of these cases have gone on for five years. So five years later, you realize that the, the, the case is weak. Now, you know, if it's one case or two cases, and I think that happened, has happened mm. previously, you're like, okay, that, that's possible. Mm. We are all human beings. Yeah. You could have felt that this was going in a very good direction, mm. but then later on you realize, I, there's something I missed. You but then well. if you consistently miss that for not one, not two, not three, not four, but <laughs> over now countless no, okay. cases, yeah. then there's just a, there's a problem. Either that office is not conducting itself in the manner in which it should be, either those people, people are not competent or they are not professional, and now we must really take a hard look at that particular institution. Do we have an institution that is able to execute the functions that this constitution has given it? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Because that then is worrying if, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an officer, if I'm, empl I'm employed to do something, and I keep on them making the same mistake over and over and over again. Once, okay. Twice, okay. But consistently, mm -hmm. it keeps happening with corruption cases that are affecting high level or well politically connected individuals, then there's a problem. Okay. Either, you're, 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 either you're not independent um, and, and you have been manipulated by uh, you know the the the, 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 the powers that be yeah. or <laughs> at, at different times either the point where the case was taken to court or at the point where the application to withdraw was made mm -hmm. yes I, I just wanted to join um and what uh, sheila said part of uh, the uh, uh, the reason why these cases end up collapsing in the court or they are being deliberately collapsed yeah is actually the problem actually begins at the stage where the cases commence and uh, of course what any other political uh, any, other, any other kenyan knows is that the po politics infiltrates the decisions to charge if you look at the policy guideline on how decisions are supposed to be made is that there's a rule within the office of the dpp is that if it's corruption case or terrorism case uh, he must give a direct and express approval okay. to uh, to um, commence that case and that is what brings now the, what we call the dynamic of selectivity. Because now the DPP now can decide who do I charge or who do I not charge. Mm. You see, once the report comes from the ESCC and it's on his table, and this is a high political figure or a politically inclined person, you know, so he has the discretion, he has the power to decide whether or not uh, 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 to charge that person. It is this dynamic of selectivity that later on, actually impedes the prosecution of the case as time goes by. Because if it is a politically instigated uh, prosecutorial process, mm -hmm. definitely the decision was taken on what in law we call a prima facie case. By just looking at the case and you rush to court, you begin the prosecution, there is no, actually no substantive evidence. The other culture that I think also plagues and brings this uh, collapsing of cases is the institutional fragmentation, by the way, in the criminal justice system. We have the DPP, we have the ESCC, we have the DCI, and all these are agents, asset recovery unit that are involved in criminal investigations. But remember, there is no cooperative mechanism oh, or cohesion uh -huh. Uh -huh. to coordinate these institutions. Uh -huh. The DPP can only return the file, and he cannot direct about how to do uh, investigations. At times, the DCI also com begin or commence the investigation when they are pursuing a particular vendetta or a particular agenda. But you see, that agenda may not be aligned with that of the DPP. So it is this institution of fragmentation that at times also leads to the collapse under the, or the automatic withdrawal of these cases because once the trial begins or commences, you realize that the, the decision for charging this person could not actually be uh, attained or sustainable because there was actually no evidence in the first place. Other motives infiltrated this process. And by the way, they need not necessarily be uh, political uh, motives. There could be uh, business rivalry involved. At times it could be family rivalry involved because there have been cases where one family member has taken another family member before the court. Right. Yeah, or ethnic agenda, for, uh, uh, for example. So this is the reason why these cases end up at some point, then they become stultified, because the evidential threshold was not met at the very beginning. People were keen to prosecute these cases out of their own agenda to satisfy their own motives. Yeah, but I think the political uh, uh, motive dominates uh, to a greater extent. Okay. On, that, on that issue of coordination and the fragmentation of these institutions, 
that are involved in enforcement when you look at investigation and, and prosecution. Yeah. There was an attempt, I think it was in 2014 or 15, mm -hmm. to put together a multi-agency team, uh, that MAT we called it, but it was not anchored in law. I think I'll call it more it was an administrative initiative and mm -hmm. involved many of the enforcement institutions in the country, those ESCC, those ODPP, there was uh, ICARE even, there was uh, DCI, uh, and I think it was chaired by the, 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 Attorney, General's, the Attorney General's office. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that mechanism is now in place, but at some point you could see mm -hmm. that coordination between the different offices. What maybe could have happened is, this again, are many of them are independent. Uh, of offices and, and yes, institutions that whose mandate is protected in the constitution. So of course there were those concerns around you know do you take orders from another mm -hmm. office? You are independent. Mm -hmm. You are only supposed to be subservient to the constitution. So the, I think there are some of those maybe teething problems and also other other you know things that may have affected how it was how it was sustained. As a, as, a, as, a, as a unit, yeah. but I think it's maybe something that we need to revisit, but ensure that still within that mechanism, because I, we need these offices to work together. Mm. We need them to work together to be able to be successful, because this is a, a the, the, in terms of anti-corruption cases, and even just criminal cases, there's a, there's a chain that, there's, it's a chain. True. You know, you move from investigation mm -hmm. uh, to prosecution to adjudication involving hearing and determination of the case. And then you also have, well, in terms of corruption cases, you know, recovery of, of those assets. Yeah. So all these p units must be speaking to each other, you know, no, and not publicly, because sometimes we see mm -hmm. them, you know, then we see those public spots and so on. But we expect some kind of coordination. But maybe we need to look at the law and see how they can be able to have that kind of mechanism but with, without infringing on each other's mandates and without affecting each of their independence. Independence and interdependence. It yes. is, it's quite it interesting. Is. But we're having this conversation in terms of fragmentation. And I understand just last week in mm -hmm. court, ideally, you would expect the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution and the ESCC to work in tandem to perhaps prosecute a case uh, for the good of the public in terms of graft and whatnot. But Wakili, we had an interesting scenario where the ODPP lawyers and the ESCC lawyers were at loggerheads in regards to a case uh, touching on a graft case for the KPMC, KPC rather, managing mm -hmm. director. Now, this is not a sight to behold, especially when we're talking about it's a chain. We need uh, the strength of the chain and a weak link will definitely break it all down. How mm. would you highlight this unfortunate turn of events? How do we avoid such scenarios in the future? Such a phenomenon mm. uh, is very common. Actually, it's historical and this is not the first time it mm. has happened. And it takes me back to the same same uh, concept or notion I've said uh, of a dynamic of selectivity. Because remember, the boss when it comes to prosecution is the DPP. But the boss when it comes to investigation is either the ESCC, the DCI, and those other agencies. Mm -hmm. These people could probably be pursuing different agenda that maybe the other person. So the left does not know what the right hand is doing. And it is pr uh, primarily because uh, uh, institutions have not really deeply internalized um, the tenets that undergird the criminal accountability system in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And that's why people are used to the same ways of doing things like in the past. You know, they do not understand that, first of all, the mandate of prosecution belongs to the DPP. They also do not understand that when you are exercising, for, for example, the investigatory power, which is a power under the various agencies conferred by the constitution or the relevant law, there ought also to be some sort of accountability. So the DPP's office, when you see such kind of spats or disagreements on who to prosecute, who not to prosecute, when you see the files being returned mm. by the DPP, one the wants to withdraw, center, the other doesn't. The, yes. Yeah. It seems to me that uh, the agenda that in these institutions are serving, there's no synergy. You know, there's no coherence, there's no coordination. In fact, it, it interdependence is completely a different thing. They're interdependent because the DPP depends on them mm -hmm. to conduct investigations. 
Now, how do we resolve that problem? That is the question. And by the way, um, the, the, the spark between these institutions, the first one that was, the other one that was witnessed was a case that was filed by Okia Mtata Okoiti. Mm. And uh, in, that, in that case, Okia argued that the power to charge, draft charges, actually belongs to the DPP. So you could see a case that in one way or another was, could have been sponsored by either uh, appendage of the government uh, to, pro to put the DPP and the DCI at loggerheads. Okay. And the argument there is that the DPP only has power to prosecute. And they actually went ahead in splitting hairs and say the power to prosecute commences at the time when the, the investigators have done the investigation, they have drafted the charges. So they even wanted to take away the drafting of the charges <laughs> from the DPP and arrogate it to themselves. Mm -hmm. When you see such mad craze for the arrogation of power that are not constitutionally sanctioned, it tells you something. What is the agenda? And I think that is the, when it comes to intergovernmental coordination, particularly those people who are involved in the criminal justice accountability system, it is proper that these institutions sit back again. Perhaps there need to be a law, a legislation that should govern all this. Otherwise, we will still have situations where the DCI presents suspects in court, the DPP is not even having the file, the mm -hmm. charges have not been drafted. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, the greed for power of investigation still really has to be checked. Okay, okay. And Sheila, as you come in, mm. perhaps equally add your voice to that push and pull we've seen. Yeah. It would be proper to note the take of the civil society in extension Transparency International because we've had of reforms around prosecutorial powers. Mm. ESCC definitely trying to target that constitutional power that they mm. don't have as we speak right now mm. that they say will enhance the fight against graft in the country. From where you sit as civil society, mm. is this a step in the right direction perhaps? So one of the campaigns previously, and that was maybe 10 years ago, was a campaign to give EACC prosecutorial powers. Actually, it was more than 10 years. It said way before even during the, before EACC, mm -hmm. at the at time of its predecessor, that was uh, the KSCC. And uh, there was a clamor, can we consider prosecutorial powers for our anti-corruption commission? Yeah. And that has happened in other countries. And, and even the other agencies in this country which have prosecutorial powers. So those questions of why not give that mandate to the, the, the institution yeah. charged with the responsibility of investigating such that the person who, the, the institution that has done the investigation, because they have the history and knowledge of the case, they've spent so much time on this mm -hmm. case, might be better placed to work hand in hand, say, with the, with the legal department who uh, are able to prosecute that matter and maybe we'll be able to see better success. I think it's something that we agonized over because at that point there was very little uh, success in the courts in regard to convictions, mm -hmm. and we thought about that. And in 2015, when the ESCC Act was amended, one of the proposals that we made was, can we provide, give a provision for ESCC to be able to prosecute. That did go through. Yeah. And there were other attempts. We had the, the, the legislative policy and institutional uh, review, a big review process that was being led by the former Attorney General, Professor Gizu Mugai. Again, that proposal was made there, but it, well, I, that, that report is sitting somewhere. It's one of those many reports sitting on a shelf somewhere. Oh, yeah. That yeah. didn't go through. And I, I, I guess in, from 2018, when things started kind of moving in the right direction in regard to the investigation and prosecution of corruption cases. And we could see that camaraderie and you know, mm. uh, ability of these institutions to be able to work together under this mat. You know, we had the DCI being able to work with ODPP, ODPP was able to work with the SEC, and things seemed to be moving smoothly. Yeah. And we started seeing results in terms of you know, corruption cases. At, because initially, even the number of cases that were getting to, <laughs> to, to, to where we were even seeing charge sheets or where people were actually being charged in court were very few. But now we started seeing this happening. Okay. And we thought, okay, hold on, maybe this will work. And, but now, I think in the last two years, mm. what has shown us is that it, 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 really, it really is also about someone's goodwill, this aspect around political goodwill. There's also 
you may have leadership that is keen <coughs> on it, but then there are some who will not be. So yeah. some things go beyond institutions, and maybe we may now want to think about how do we legislate this issue? How do we institutionalize some of these um, ideas um, so that we are able to then ring fence uh, our, 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 our you know, prosecution against, against corruption? And I think it is now about time that we perhaps may need to think about giving ESCC the prosecutorial uh, powers, yeah, because it's, it's just not working. If, if every other week we are seeing cases being withdrawn or cases uh, being lost. Uh, the other option, if we don't go that route, is can we consider the gazettement of some of the, the, the ESCC uh, legal staff who have the capacity and the experience, uh, can they be gazetted as special prosecutors? Because ODPP can gazette special prosecutors. He's done that before okay. for some high level cases. Mm -hmm. Can we have <coughs> some of those people within ESCC who may have this experience and this ability to prosecute, right. uh, to be gazetted, even as we look into long term uh, review of, of, the, of the law? Okay. Giving ESCC prosecutorial powers, is it a double edged sword? Some might argue that way. You know? um, one, I think the there isn't something wrong with uh, uh, have the DPP having the exclusive mandate to prosecute. Mm -hmm. But um, we do know that, for example, the DPP does not have capacity to prosecute all these cases. And I think that's why it is justified, it is right, it's actually opportune to have the DPP confer that power to other officers subordinate to him or to other institutions. He can, the constitution gives him that power. Yeah. But I think the fact that there is no institutional coordination and there's a tug of war between these institutions will not be solved that by that problem. Because remember, institutional cultures die hard. I think one of the things that Justice Aaron Ringera taught us or reminded us is that, you know, corruption fights back. You know, it's hydra-headed. Mm -hmm. So that if, even if you want to fight it at the, at the ESCC, it will morph and become something else. If you run to the DCI, it will still morph and become something else. Even if you give the asset recovery power to prosecute, I mean, to uh, 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 pursue this illegally acquired wealth yep. through a civil process, mm -hmm. you will still have a tug of war between asset recovery and ESCC. The problem is far much broader than that. And I think that's why our institutional cultures have to change. Corruption will still permeate the ESCC officers who have been given to the mandate to prosecute it will still permit the special prosecutors who may come from the DCI or any asset recovery unit or any other institution. Mm -hmm. Let us have a culture change, a mindset shift. You know, those are some of the proper ways. And by the way, uh, even academically, I know there's a concept called institutional bypasses. <laughs> so that if all these institutions cannot fight corruption, can we invent other institutions? that perhaps may still work within these institutions, mm -hmm. but they work outside cultures. It has worked elsewhere. And one of the good examples yeah. is, if you cannot get a government service when you are going to get an ID, yeah. you'd rather go through the Uduma Center and you have it. If you cannot get uh, a legal service or an order through the normal court process and you go to Uduma Center, this is a, these are the institutional bypasses mm -hmm. we are talking about. Okay. We just have to be innovative. We just have to be creative. By these institutional bypasses, you will have at least to bypass these political expediencies mm -hmm. and contingencies, you know. You will also bypass the limited understanding within which a public prosecutor perceives their mandate. Because I think the minimalist understanding of the prosecution is when, once there's a criminal conduct, the next best thing to do is to arrest him and prosecute him. Mm -hmm. That is not the only way. Once there is, for example, in corruption cases, in graph cases which involve public assets, can you even pursue this uh, 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 conduct in a civil case where even the threshold is minimal so that the public glare will be shifted to how has the asset been recovered rather than who has gone to, co uh, to prison? Okay. That should not be the focus of this yeah. country. These are some of the culture shifts that we are talking about through institutional bypasses. I think my concern in that regard, because we've seen it in this country, where you have a multiplicity of institutions. For instance, I'll give the example of investigation, where you've had DCI mm -hmm. investigating, ESCC investigating, and I think sometimes that's where the corrupt 
now will start now I'll have a, mm. yeah because you, you, you have you have a choice so you you can <laughs> let me use the words of my friend uh, Willie Socheno my former colleague yeah. picky picky yeah. punky <laughs> <laughs> you can decide which one which one will will take up this matter and yeah, which yeah. one is weaker in this regard or uh -huh. stronger in this regard and and then you you you, you give them several options i think we, we really just need, we have institutions, we have them entrenched in the constitution. I believe we really need to just take a hard look and see how we, for, for some it's really just about strengthening them okay. and giving them the enabling laws, like I believe in the case of, of ESCC. Before we, I, I, I like the, 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 concept, like the concept of institutional bypasses, mm -hmm. but I think in Kenya, that may not work looking at the politics of the day where people now start playing these different institutions. But I th one of the other examples I think I would like to give, and Wakili has already mentioned this, yeah. is on civil forfeitures. Uh, you've seen yeah. some level of success in terms of how we have been able to recover public, lost, stolen public, we say lost, but they're not lost, they're stolen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> stolen public assets uh, from, uh, from, from certain individuals. And I would say there's been a level of success. We've seen a number of proceeds uh, right. of, you know, of crime being, 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 you know, be, being recovered yeah. mm -hmm. and, and repatriated back into our country, back mm -hmm. into the economy. And I'll use that example to, to, to perhaps, maybe just at face value say that is in this maybe a reason or an example of what EACC can be able to do if given the mandate because if they've been able to have that success mm -hmm. and they've done that in-house with their with their own lawyers you know if we were to able to enhance their mandate and look into this issue of prosecution of course i'm saying this is just for me at face value of course there are many other considerations that have to be made i don't work there so i, I don't know the real the <laughs> level of, details, of, of yeah. capacity and yeah, so yeah. on looking at the intricacies in regards to prosecution of cases okay. but i just point that as an example mm -hmm. yeah Okay, interesting. Mm. Food for thought. Uh, it's proper to have these discussions. So definitely, it spars uh, conversations around this all important topic. If we could just have the judgment by Justice Sifuna, because we haven't had your reactions to it, what exactly it will do in terms of the timeliness and the essential nature of that particular ruling. And uh, in that ruling, Justice Sifuna on 31st January 2024, if we could have part of it on the screen for the sake of our viewers. He told the DPP that he is bound by his decision to charge and cannot just wake up one day to take a 360 degrees turn, a U-turn to drop those charges. I'd like your reaction, gentlemen and lady, to this particular ruling in terms of the timely, the essence and how it will be important going forward as it sets a precedence. Uh, what can you, oh, let's start with you, Sheila, briefly. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, one is asserting the mandate of the court in terms of you have to get the court's permission uh, to be able to withdraw or terminate a case. And that is entrenched in the constitution. And it was yeah. good that he pointed mm -hmm. the DPP that it is not your mandate to, to, uh, to, to give, uh, <laughs> say that one is guilty or not guilty. Because when you look at the, the previous application to withdraw, and even not just on this case, you know, when you say you don't have enough evidence and you're not sure whether that case is strong enough and so on, mm. um, you, you want that person, you want that case withdrawn. And particularly where, for instance, I think in this particular last matter with the Kenya Pipeline case, is where they were seeking the withdrawal of charges on one individual, but then leave two others on the case. So are you saying that one person is innocent and the others, are <laughs> you know, then can continue to be processed by the court? Yeah. I think that was important yeah. to show that the, that the court has to be part of that, actually is the one to make that decision. Okay. And then secondly is, I think he also tried to clamp down on this increasing trend by the, the, the DPP to, you know, you take matters to court, then four years later you say, you know what, I, I realize this, this, this matter is weak. I think we need to ensure that the DPP is able to make a decision. Yeah. If it's not ready for court, then don't take it for court. No point to rush a matter to court. 
wait until you have all your ducks lined up and you're clear that I can get a conviction beyond reasonable doubt mm. if I present this file and proceed uh, uh, with, with the charges. I think also if you look at, it's not just Sifuna's, uh, Justice Sifuna's um, ruling, but if you look at even two rulings by, uh, the, 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 by Justice, uh, not Justice, but Magistrate, tri the Trial Magistrate, uh, in the Kukumil. Sonko case, the one for the 357 million yes. that where he was mm -hmm. recently acquitted, that was in Mutu. Yeah. And then the same magistrate on the matter of the Aror Kimware, okay. the, 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 the decision by uh, initially by the, the DPP to want to withdraw, to, to withdraw or adjourn the matter. Um, and, and actually, she actually called it, this is reckless, not just dereliction mm. of duty, but reckless dereliction of duty for emphasis. Yeah. And, and one of the, in her, in her ruling in the Sonko matter, she actually raises the same things that Justice Tifuna raises. In this last case with the Kenya pipeline and the attempt to withdraw charges against the MD, mm -hmm. he actually made a point that in the application by, by Sirma, uh, where he sought a uh, challenge, the decision by the magistrate um, not to ag accept the withdrawal of charges, yeah. and then he now takes the DPP to court. The DPP did not even file any response. He actually said that, that the DPP did not file any response. They attended court routinely, did not say anything, you know, and he actually now raises question, then what is the role of the DPP? Mm. <laughs> you have been taken to court by an accused person but you decide that you're not going to respond at all. Yeah. So for me, that is now double recklessness when in regard to what Mutu had earlier said in regard to dereliction of duty. So we must take note of this trend by the DPP. And that's why I say we really need to look at that particular institution in terms of competence and also professionalism. Because mm. if this, these issues are not coming from us as, as citizens mm -hmm. or, or, as, or as civil society, Th they are being raised by the judges and magistrates who have had those matters for more than five years. And they are the ones who are pointing some of these worrying trends in regard to how the DPP is con uh, ODPP is conducting itself in some of these uh, matters, very serious corruption matters. And we'll get to the accountability aspect because, mm. I mean, something must give. As you come in, Wakili Miyawa, Justice Ifuna did not address the fact that the Constitution allows the DPP to withdraw. So if court declines, is it good practice to prosecute? Talk to us about that. Yes, um, to begin on that point, um, one thing that uh, Justice Sefuna did not address is that the DPP has the power, enjoys the power to withdraw a case. But there's a constitutional rider to it, and I think he intimated on it, and he says, the withdrawal of a case has a court to be explained. Mm -hmm. It is the court to grant the permission. Mm -hmm. So that the power that the DPP enjoys to withdraw a case, he must understand, and I want him to listen, he must understand that that power is fettered. It is not absolute. Mm -hmm. It has actually been clawed back by the Constitution. So that he must know from the decision of Justice Sifuna before he sends out any of his officers, they must be prepared with sufficient and good explanation why the case is being withdrawn. And Justice Sifun has made two clear uh, things, and I think this is very progressive and transformative jurisprudence. He says two critical things. One, when it comes to the question of evidence, that is not the mandate, the province of the DPP. That is the province of the court. Two, mm -hmm. when you come here to withdraw a case, Please read Article 157.11. Public interest, the interest of justice, and the need to stop the abuse of power, or abuse of the prosecutorial power. Yes. Those three things are what is important. So don't just walk into the, into the court and tell the court that we are withdrawing the case with, with, without uh, giving an explanation. That indeed, that culture of just terminating cases without explanation, is a pre-2010 constitutional uh, occurrence. In the post-2010 constitutional dispensation is an anomaly. Now, one thing that I can uh, say about the decision by Justice Sifuna is that it marks, by the way, a fundamental rapture, a radical rapture with the past. 
for public prosecutors, for lawyers in this country, they must know that from the decision of, of uh, Justice Sifun, at least before it is challenged, mm -hmm. if it is challenged at the Court of Appeal, well and good. But if it is not challenged, it remains the law that the power to withdraw a case has to be sufficiently explained before the court and the, the three considerations that I've just mentioned yeah. must be yeah. at least inform the decision of the public prosecutor. Okay. The other thing, and I think this goes back to institutional cultures, I do know that I train young lawyers, whether at the law school and the Kenya School of Law, and one thing that I always remind them is that sitting there as a public prosecutor, as a state counsel, as a judge, as a magistrate, you know that you are performing a public duty. Some of those duties, you could be a subordinate officer, for example, in the office of the DPP, a subordinate mm -hmm. officer under the, uh, the DPP. You are exercising constitutional duties. Your whims should not infiltrate that case. Mm -hmm. I think what Sheila is talking about, the fact that you have 41 witnesses, eight of them are, are, are cross-examined and re-examined in court. The remaining 36 come, back, come to court and say nothing. Mm -hmm. Where was the public prosecutor? People have to wake up and take their jobs seriously, at least if they do know that those jobs are constitutional uh, duties, they're supposed to protect Kenyans. Um, at times we may blame the DPP so much, but whatever goes on in court, because remember there are public prosecutors all over the country, he may not be aware on how each and every file is handled by a, a, a different uh, public prosecutor yeah. or a prosecution yeah. counsel. Yeah. It therefore becomes incumbent on him to require a report, particularly on these leading cases. And where there are questions of evidence involved, can he pursue other mechanisms of criminal accountability, not just mere withdrawals? Mm. Would he not go for other mechanisms? Can you go for asset forfeiture, asset recovery, reconciliation? Can you enter into plea bargains, for example, where somebody admits to the offense, and perhaps it's treated differently, not necessarily through the criminal prosecution process. All right. All right. Mm. Well, he's spoken about accountability. Yeah. Could add to that as yeah. we finalize it. Add to that, I think it's important to note that as part of civil society, uh, Transparency International, Kenya, Katiba Institute, Kenya Human Rights Commission, and AFRICOG have actually sued the two prosecutors who handled rather mishandled the Aurora and Kimura case mm. where you remember where the, uh, the magistrate actually pointed out that <coughs> there was just the reliction of duty by the prosecutors. They worked so hard to drop that case. Mm. And we actually have, we moved to court late last year, the tail end of the year, uh, to just seek personal accountability from these officers who handled uh, this matter, and we are seeking uh, court's permission that the, the immunity granted to them as prosecutors is lifted so that they can take personal uh, liability. Because all these years that this case has progressed, money has been lost. Mm -hmm. lot of, we already have the 63 billion in question. I understand it even more in regard to what was lost in that particular matter. So where do Kenyans get justice? Where do we recover these costs lost? We need to start holding public officers personally liable for some of these, uh, whether it's acts of omission or commission. And, and, and this is one example that we will be, we are, we, are, we are taking up. We're just waiting for, I think, a mention in June uh, to see how we proceed uh, with that particular matter. But we thought it was very important, and I believe it's one of the ways yeah. in which we will continue to seek uh, personal accountability because when someone serves in that kind of office, you should know that you need to defend the, the public interest. True. And if you don't, then you're not fit to hold that particular office. We need to get to that point where public officers know that the people they need to work for are Kenyans. Not, not the elite, political elite, or other people with vested interest. Okay. The, the second thing that I, need, I think needs to be done in terms of ensuring that there's accountability uh, by, uh, in, in these kind of matters and how these cases are, are handled. And if you read Newtu's ruling on the Sonko matter, yeah. the 357 million case, is she actually also suggested that can we have considered regulations where prosecutors are held personally 
uh, liable okay. when they play around or they, they don't yes, take yes, these yeah. matters uh, uh, seriously. So that's also something that we need to look at. But overall, mm -hmm. as I said, let us look at the, our anti-corruption laws. I know some, we, we have argued that, yes, we have several laws, but some of them are, are still weak mm -hmm. you know, and, and not strong enough to be able to sufficiently support the fight against corruption, to sufficiently enable the institutions that have been charged with this mandate to fully execute the job that the Constitution has given them. So let us look at that. Even as we speak now, there are attempts to water down some of the laws. We are currently looking at the conflict of interest mm -hmm. uh, bill, but then there are there's still been attempts by political interest to water down some of those provisions. Right. We have had just come, up, come from a very uh, big fight with regard to trying to protect the provisions of the Anti-Corruption anti -corruption and, and Economic Crimes Act. And we still need to continue to be vanguards in terms of ensuring that we protect uh, the legislation that we have in regard to the fight against corruption. Okay, and that's how the civil society and members of the fourth estate actually push the message and make sure that those uh, who are supposed to be held accountable actually are. Gentlemen and lady, I think it was a timely discussion. Thank you so much for your input. And I'm sure most of our audience are now learned friends, quote unquote. They <laughs> understand the law a little bit much better. Sheila Masinde, Executive thank Director, you. Transparency International. Thank you so much for your time and your input. Dr. Maxwell Miyawa, always a pleasure. He's a scholar and constitutional lawyer. That brings us to the end of tonight's edition of KTN Prime. Hope you're adequately informed and you've enjoyed the proceedings we've had right here in studio. My name is Jesse Rogers. Have yourself a good evening. Asante.